In this video, I'm going to present five tips on necessary assumption questions. And these will be points that are related to common areas that students struggle with in necessary assumption questions. But these tips will also relate more generally to logical reasoning, because as you probably know, identifying assumptions is a core skill across many different question types. And so you should view the advice in this video as not just applying to necessary assumption questions, but also applying to logical reasoning generally. Now, the first tip to keep in mind is that assumptions can be both necessary for an argument to be valid, as well as sufficient to make the argument valid. Sometimes when people are studying necessary and sufficient assumption questions, they get it in their mind that these ideas are somehow mutually exclusive, that if something is necessary, then it's not a sufficient assumption, or if something's a sufficient assumption, then it's not a necessary assumption. But that's actually totally wrong. You can have a statement that is both necessary and sufficient, and in fact, on many different necessary assumption questions, as well as sufficient assumption questions, the right answer is indeed both necessary and sufficient. So let me give you an example of that. Here is an argument, a basic argument, where the premise is all pigs have wings, and the conclusion is thus all pigs can fly. So if you're thinking about what this argument is assuming, probably you're thinking it's assuming that if something has wings, then that means it can fly. And that is indeed what I would be thinking uh, in, when I'm identifying an assumption. One way to phrase that would be anything that has wings can fly. Now let's think about that for a moment. That is a sufficient assumption because if it were true, then it would definitely guarantee that because pigs have wings, they can fly. But it's also a necessary assumption and it would be the correct answer to a necessary assumption question as well. Why? Well, because if it were not true that anything that has wings can fly, or in other words, if there were some things with wings that could not fly, then you would no longer be able to get from the premise that pigs have wings automatically to the conclusion that pigs can fly. Now, I know through experience that a lot of students who would see this type of answer on a necessary assumption question would actually think that it's wrong because it's too strong, or they would recognize that it's sufficient and in their mind, they would say, oh, well, that's a sufficient assumption, but not a necessary assumption. But that line of reasoning is totally wrong because whether something is sufficient for an argument to be valid has no bearing on whether it's necessary for the argument to be valid. So if you're ever tempted to think this is sufficient, so therefore it's not a necessary assumption, banish that from your mind because that is just not how you evaluate what is necessary. The way that you evaluate what is necessary is to ask, if it were not true, would the argument's premise still support the conclusion? And in this case, if it were not true that anything that has wings can fly, this premise would not support the conclusion anymore. We would need to provide more information, more evidence, more premises to prove that pigs can fly. Now, I think a visual might help to reinforce the idea that assumptions can be both sufficient and necessary for the argument to be valid. So think of the uh, first black bar here as the premise, and then the target is the conclusion. The missing piece in the middle is the gap, the distance that we have to cover in order for the premise to actually prove this conclusion. Now, this blue bar you could think of as the assumption that is both sufficient and necessary. This is, uh, the blue bar is like the statement, anything that has wings can fly. It is sufficient to completely close the gap between the premise and the conclusion, but it's also necessary because if you did not close the distance of that blue bar, if you did anything less than that blue bar, then you would not be able to get from the premise to the conclusion anymore. Tip number two for necessary assumption questions is to remember that the right answer does not need to address every single gap in the argument. Remember, in a necessary assumption question, you can have arguments that are really bad, that have multiple problems with it, multiple flaws, multiple gaps. But sometimes what happens is when people are debating between two answers, 
they actually use reasoning like this. Well, this answer, it looks pretty good, but the other one is more complete, so I'm going to go with the one that's more complete. But that is a terrible line of reasoning because whether an idea is necessary for the argument to be valid has nothing to do with how complete the argument is, or rather how complete the assumption is. It only depends on the question, if this were not true, would the argument fall apart? Or in other words, if this were not true, would the premises still be able to provide support for the conclusion? And if the answer is no, they would not, then that is going to be a necessary assumption regardless of how incomplete you think it might be. So let's take a look at an example. Um, the premise says any job that exposes the people who perform it to serious physical risk should be highly compensated. Therefore, firefighters and lawyers should be highly compensated. So do you see here, this argument seems to be assuming that both firefighters and lawyers fall into the category of jobs that expose people who perform them to serious physical risk. So both of these ideas, firefighters are exposed to serious physical risk, lawyers are exposed to serious physical risk, both of these are necessary. But you know what, if you only got lawyers are exposed to serious physical risk, this bottom assumption as, a, as an answer choice, that would definitely be the correct answer. And it would be completely wrong to think, I really wanted to mention firefighters too, because it doesn't matter whether it mentions both lawyers and firefighters. Both of these are going to be necessary, and they would not give you both of these answers at the same time in, a, in an actual LSAT problem. Now, visually, one way to think about this is we have a, a two-part conclusion here. That's the, the nature of the example argument, where it was about firefighters, but it's also about lawyers. And so in order for that premise to support the conclusion, we have to close both of these gaps. We have to make both of those blue bars happen in this argument. And each of those blue bars is necessary to this conclusion. If you took away one of them, if you made the top bar, for example, even slightly shorter than it currently is, then the premise would no longer actually prove this conclusion. So that's why both of these are necessary. And the right answer, however, could just give you one of those bars. Tip number three for necessary assumptions is to remember that the right answer does not need to completely fill the gap that it's related to. Now, so far, uh, with the previous two tips, I gave you example arguments and example assumptions where the assumptions did happen to completely fill the gap that they were related to. Remember, anything that has wings can fly? That was something that was completely filling the gap, or in other words, it was sufficient to prove the conclusion. But in necessary assumption questions, sometimes what happens is you get answers that are basically within the umbrella of that larger assumption. And so uh, I think an example and a visual would best help to convey this idea. So uh, here we're going to have um, an argument that's similar to that uh, lawyer argument before. I've changed it just to be about lawyers now. So we just have one gap in the argument. Now, does it make sense then that... Uh, the assumption uh, on the board here, lawyers are exposed to serious physical risk, that, that is sufficient to prove that lawyers should be highly compensated in this argument. It's also necessary because if lawyers were not exposed to serious physical risk, then this premise would have nothing to do with proving this conclusion. But this assumption that lawyers are exposed to serious physical risk, you can think of it as almost like an umbrella assumption, and underneath that umbrella assumption, are other ideas as well. So here's uh, here are some other examples of things that would be necessary. Lawyers are exposed to at least minor physical risk. That's necessary because if it were not true that they were exposed to at least minor physical risk, or in other words, if they weren't even exposed to minor physical risk or anything more than that, then they would not be exposed to serious physical risk, and so the argument wouldn't make sense. Similarly, the very bottom assumption here, at least some jobs that involve law expose the people who perform them to more than minor physical risk. It's weirdly worded, but it is necessary because if you negate this idea, and here to negate that last sentence, you would just change the sum to no, because sum means at least one, 
So when you negate the idea of at least one, you say zero or none. So if no jobs that involve law, such as lawyers, expose the people who perform them to more than minor physical risk, that's basically saying lawyers are not exposed to more than minor physical risk, and then they would no longer fall into the category that this premise is talking about, people who are exposed to serious physical risk. So visually what's happening here is you can think of that initial assumption, the umbrella assumption, seri uh, lawyers are exposed to serious physical risk as that blue bar, but there are also weaker forms of that umbrella assumption, things that are contained within that umbrella assumption, and those are necessary. Now, those are not sufficient to make the argument valid, but they are necessary to make the argument valid. Because if you did not even close those shorter distances, then you would not be able to get from the premise to the conclusion. So if you can see one of the missing links in an argument, just be ready for the correct answer on necessary assumption questions to be weaker forms of that umbrella assumption. Tip number four is to remember that the right answer on necessary assumption questions can mention things that were not brought up in the stimulus. Sometimes students will have this bad habit of reflexively getting rid of answers that mention new ideas, things that were not brought up in the argument in the stimulus. Now, I will say that as a general matter, it's good to be skeptical of answers that bring up new information because it makes it less likely that they're necessary to the argument, but you can definitely have arguments that must assume things that were not specifically mentioned. So I'll give you a couple of examples. The first example argument is here. When I arrived home this evening, books and other items that have been on my desk and drawer were scattered on the floor. My landlord is the only person besides me who has a key to my apartment. Therefore, my landlord must be responsible for knocking those items to the floor. So what would you say this argument is assuming? Well, it seems to be assuming that the landlord was the cause of the uh, items being on the floor. That because he was the only person who had access and we found the items on the floor, that it must be the landlord who is the cause of that effect. And one way to phrase that assumption is, there is no other explanation for how the items got on the floor. That is necessary to assume because if there were other explanations for how the items got on the floor, then we would no longer be able to automatically conclude that the landlord was responsible. But now let's take a look at another example assumption. No one broke into my apartment by picking the lock on the front door. Isn't that necessary? Because if actually someone did break into the apartment by picking the lock on the front door, then maybe that's the person who was responsible for knocking the items to the floor. Sure, the landlord had a key, but if someone could get in without a key, then we can no longer be sure it was the landlord. So this is definitely necessary, even though it's mentioning completely new ideas, it seems, like picking the lock uh, on, on the front door. Let me give you another example. A major earthquake did not occur just before I arrived at home this evening. Isn't this necessary? Because if a major earthquake did occur or had occurred just before I arrived home, then the earthquake could be the thing that's responsible for the items on the floor, and it wasn't necessarily the landlord. It doesn't have to be the landlord if it could have been an earthquake. So again, this is necessary to this argument, even though the idea of major earthquake was clearly not brought up. So let me show you one visual for what's happening here. The uh, blue bar that is going from the premise to the conclusion that is filling that gap, but also necessary, you can think of that as no other explanation for the items being on the floor besides my landlord. That is like the umbrella assumption in this argument. But within that umbrella assumption are a bunch of smaller pieces, because if there's no other explanation for how it got on the floor, then that means it wasn't an earthquake, it wasn't someone who picked the lock, it wasn't a ghost throwing items around, right? There are a whole bunch of specific explanations that are being ruled out by the umbrella assumption. And that is often what happens on necessary assumption questions. 
The umbrella assumption is that there was no other explanation for what happened, but then the correct answer could just be presented as one very specific thing that is being ruled out. And uh, you might think of this as related to that previous tip about how the right answer does not need to completely fill the gap in an argument. Eliminating one specific explanation does not completely fill the gap, but it is definitely necessary because it falls underneath that umbrella assumption of how there's no other explanation. Now, I want to present you with another example of an argument related to this point that the right answer can bring up things that were not mentioned in the stimulus, because sometimes people are under the impression that uh, you should be more open to new information only on arguments that have that structure of observation followed by potential explanation. That is where you are commonly presented with answers that bring up new information, but the LSAT can get very creative. The writers really know how to trick people. And so you also might need to be on notice and might need to be open to new information in the stimulus, new information in an answer choice because it could still be necessary on other kinds of argument forms. So here's an example. Any student who works hard only on class assignments that are graded is not truly interested in the subject of the class. Thus, even though Timmy got the highest grade in his physics class, he is not truly interested in physics. So in order to reach this conclusion that Timmy is not truly interested in physics, based on that premise, we have to assume that Timmy falls into the category of people who work hard only on the physics class assignments that are graded. He doesn't work hard on any physics class assignments that are not graded. And this is a way of phrasing that assumption. In his physics class, Timmy worked hard only on, assume, only on assignments that are graded. Now, consider this other potential assumption. If Timmy was assigned to write a haiku in his physics class and he worked hard on it, then the haiku was graded. Now, a lot of students would almost reflexively just eliminate this answer because it's bringing up a haiku. They don't even mention haiku, poetry, or anything like that. So how could this possibly be necessary to the argument? Well, let's actually think about what it's saying. If he was assigned to write a haiku in physics class and he worked hard on it, then it must be true that the haiku was graded. Now, there are two ways to think about how this is necessary. One way is through negation. So what if even though Timmy was assigned to write a haiku in his physics class and he worked hard on it, what if that haiku was not graded? That's the negation of this idea. If he was working hard on the haiku that was assigned in his physics class, but it wasn't graded, then that means he's not someone who works hard only on graded assignments. And that would then mean he does not fall into the category of people that this rule in the premise is about we would no longer be able to say that he automatically is not interested because this premise would now have nothing to do with Timmy if you negated this assumption. So that's one way to think about why it's necessary. The other way to think about why this is necessary is to call back to that umbrella assumption earlier. Remember, in his physics class, Timmy worked hard only on assignments that were graded. That is necessary. But if that's necessary, then that implies that any specific assignment in his physics class that we happen to name, if he worked hard on it, then it has to be graded, right? He, if he worked hard on, um, on let's say, a, a, a science project in his physics class, then that must mean it was graded. If he wrote a, a haiku, for example, in his physics class, and that was considered an assignment, then it must be graded. If he uh, was assigned to sing a song in his physics class and he happened to work hard on it, then we would know that it's graded. Any specific thing that you know he worked hard on in his physics class that was an assignment, you would know is graded because it falls underneath this umbrella assumption. And so visually, that's, uh, that's what's happening here. Each of those tiny pieces are the specific things that he worked hard on in his physics class, a haiku a science project, a song, a dance, all of those are contained within the broader idea that he worked hard on only graded things in his physics class. So if you're shooting for a very high LSAT score, you have to be careful about getting rid of answers 
merely because they seem to mention something new that wasn't in the stimulus. As you can see, the LSAT writers can get very creative, and you still have to assess, is this answer necessary? It's, it might be unnecessary because the new information has no impact on the argument, but it could still be necessary for the reasons that you saw in these other examples. Now the final tip that I want to leave you with is uh, just the idea that all of the points in this video apply any time that you're identifying necessary assumptions in an argument, not just for necessary assumption questions. So, for example, if you're doing a flaw question, sometimes flaw answer choices are presented in the form of a necessary assumption, if the answer is starting with takes for granted or presumes. So if this pigs can fly argument were presented in a flaw question, the answer could very well be takes for granted that anything that has wings can fly, or presumes without justification that anything that has wings can fly. But the answer could also be assumes that at least some things that have wings can fly. That would be like the weaker form of this umbrella assumption. That could definitely be a correct answer in a flaw question. And if you got this lawyers should be highly compensated argument and it was a flaw question, well, the answer could very well be that bottom example assumes that at least some jobs that involve law expose the people who perform them to more than minor physical risk. So that's why the ideas in this video can apply to all different kinds of problems in logical reasoning. Don't think of these as only relevant to necessary assumption questions.